Welcome everyone to episode 62 of Kiss Meets the Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Eli Clawson. And I have significantly less facial hair than last time. Man, we both do actually. and That's true. Less less head hair. At least <laughs> me, not you. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm probably about the same. So yeah, I guess, uh, why not? We'll start with that. A little uh, review. Um, Sweet Pain, our Kiss tribute band. We just played a show this past Saturday in Greenville place called Sloopy's um, show turned out uh, really good um, I know it exceeded my expectations yeah as far as uh, audience turnout yeah yes. without it had, had good feelings about the vibe that started you know once we started promoting it but then what actually showed up was not completely blew me away yeah yeah I'd say there were at least at least for a decent amount of time the place was packed I yeah. Bet. Oh yeah, you know we walked in that door and you know people were clapping and you know the reaction like that's the first time I've ever had that happen. You know it's like kind of caught me off guard for a minute and then kind of like doing the the wave like the royal wave like yeah we're cool. Yeah. <laughs> and the rest of you guys walked in like the evil kids just like holding your guitars and. I think Gino did the he did that. No. <laughs> I saw him do that, and I was like, I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly there was a Melissa standing off to the side like, oh, no. <laughs> it's not really there. <laughs> What's his trick? <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, great venue. If you go to our uh, Sweet Pain Facebook page, you know, there's a couple video clips that people shot, uh, plenty of photos, uh, give you an idea, but... We'll definitely return to that place probably uh, this fall. And, you know, we definitely have a few other dates lined up already. Just kind of waiting to get them rock solid and uh, something a little special coming up too that we'll announce later uh, with another tribute band. So that's going to be a really good show to attend. <laughs> but yeah, overall, um, I don't know. What what'd you think? I mean, the show itself i mean great reaction from the crowd um yeah a lot of participation heard a lot of singing singing along and you know it felt good man it was nice it did yeah for sure and i uh i have now made it through my third show without falling on my face on those platforms <laughs> so that's, i'm pretty happy about that i was i was actually i was more worried about that this time than the other two because uh in my little area that i was standing there were three different sections of stage that were supposed to have been even that weren't quite, you know, just enough that in regular shoes it wasn't that noticeable. But the second you're on platforms and you step back too far and you're expecting to be on solid ground and you rock back a little farther than you should. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like That's, the chair in the hotel room. As soon as I sat down, I was like, holy shit. I thought I was going to fall and <laughs> break my neck before the show. <laughs> definitely. And then... Uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part, everything went really solid, as solid as, as we're capable of being. I had a couple of wireless malfunctions, which was a tiny bit annoying. That's always, you know, slightly embarrassing, but what are you going to do? If that's the only technical difficulty you have, you're still doing good. <laughs> yeah, you know, those things happen from time to time, unfortunately. And, you know, right. even even KISS themselves have those issues at times. Right. And, you know, I was worried I was going to fall on my face, too, just crawling out from behind the drums to do Beth and that kind of stuff because it was a little tight uh, yeah. this, for this particular setup. And I was like, oh, God, please don't trip and fall in front of all these people. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been so good, though, if I uh, had. It's, it, it's going to happen to one or both of us at one point. Yeah, yeah, we'll probably end up bumping into each other and both falling. <laughs> we'll fall off the stage. and. <laughs> I thought about that, too. I thought about walking off the stage at one point, because uh, Gino did. He walked out during, what was it, Lick It Up? I believe so, yeah. yeah. And and kind of walked around in the crowd, and, and I thought, that's cool. I kind of want to do that, too, and, and just never found the opportunity where, A, I didn't have anything really important that I needed to sing, and B, where I felt really confident about crossing the entire stage and coming down off of it. <laughs> at point. And then, of course, the worry of you know, what's going to happen if, if people mob me, which I'm sure they were mobbing him. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he mentioned the other day, he said that was actually the first time in the whole history of that band that he got to get that sort of vantage point to 
stand in the crowd as we're playing to get an idea what it really looked like and sounded like. And right. He said it really like even blew him away, which is, you know, if you guys know Gino, that's saying a lot. So. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I didn't even notice till I saw a picture, you know, that, you know, you got down on your knees during black diamond, you know, which I don't know how I missed that sitting right there behind the drums. I, I, I I'm thinking it was because they had so much fog going by that point that I missed uh, it, or maybe I just wasn't looking that way or something. But I mean, right. it, it's funny the things you miss, and you you, you kind of think you might have saw everything that happened, and then you look at pictures like, oh, I didn't even catch that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was actually one of the moments that I unplugged my wireless pack. Uh, oh, that it happened during shock me too in a way that everybody saw but it was it was okay it wasn't during anything super important but that moment you know it's supposed to be this epic guitar solo that's just so amazing that you have to fall to your knees to do it and right in the middle of the second section that na 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 that part mm -hmm. my just because of my boot the way i was sitting unplugged the cord out of the wireless oh. pack suddenly the solo just cuts out <laughs> So then I'm scrambling like, oh no, oh no, oh no. <laughs> See, I, I don't even recall that either. I mean, the shocked me when, yeah, I remember, but, you know, you played it off well. You know, you kept going, singing, and you right. know, all that. It wasn't too noticeable. I mean, but, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it was, I mean, I know this is only our third show we've done now, but so far I think it's the best. I mean... Yeah, you know that that first show we did when we played that Eagles Park that that was great. That was a real cool experience. It felt it felt big, but I think at this show we pretty much had the same sort of sound system. But then we had the crowd to go with it this time, where it was a much bigger crowd and they were all into it. And yeah, you know it really it really did feel good. And it was like, man, can't wait to do it again already. So right. <laughs> So. I need to do some more practicing in my platforms too. Just yeah, I think I'm all right with walking around, but the stamina of doing a four-ish hour show, pretty much standing the whole time on those that that takes a huge toll that I should have realized but didn't prior. Right, know? right. And you know, some people may not realize, but it's when you're doing especially the tribute thing, it's literally like an all-day affair. Um, you know, from tearing down the stage to take the stage pieces to the venue and then coming back, getting all the equipment and, you know, getting all that set up and, you know, setting up the lights and signs, sound checks, you know, all that crap that comes with it. And then just when you think you got a minute to sit down and you finally get back to the hotel room to relax, it's like, well, time to put, start putting the makeup and everything on. And <laughs> so, I mean, but you know what, it's worth it. Like the, 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 the time flies for me. It's, it, it it's never a moment of like oh god this is such a long day or anything it's just like it's like now i'm ready to play it's like okay we're sitting here we're all geared up and ready waiting on our van to arrive it's like all right, right. let's go yeah. <laughs> so yeah good times man um so again go go to facebook uh, check out our page sweet pain uh kiss tribute i believe is the actual title um Hey, we're willing to come anywhere, so if anybody knows of anything coming up in your area and you'd like to see us come out, hey, let us know. Please. <laughs> All right, so uh, <clears throat> getting into this week's show, we'll start off um, again. <laughs> Starting off, we already did. You got some goodies in the mail, didn't you? I did. I did. I was not expecting it. Uh, Dad texted me earlier and said, "Hey, you had a package taken out of your mailbox earlier." So I went ahead and take it, took it in, and I was like, "Package? I shouldn't take anything? What are you talking about?" And then I found the box, and it has my name on it. And I was like, "I didn't have anything coming." What? <laughs> <laughs> and then I felt stupid when I opened it up because it is the passes for the two days of the Kiss Expo. Yes. Woohoo! And colored string. Yeah. <laughs> So that's super exciting. That was uh, passes look awesome. It came with uh, a couple of different inserts. That, I don't know how well it's showing, but it's got uh, some statues from the Hotter Than Hell era. Oh, those are nice. Yeah, and then on the inside is the guest list for each day, and that's uh, excited me all over again about who's going to be there and and the stuff 
as far as who's playing, that's that's going to be excellent all in itself. Yeah, huge guest list this year. Um, you know, we covered some of it, but if you want to go ahead and read the whole guest list or everyone that isn't aware, I mean, again, yeah. again, I'll reiterate to you people, if you haven't, you know, got your tickets, let alone a hotel room, do it right away. I mean, yeah. at this point, you'll be lucky, but it's something you definitely want to be at. Right. Right. All right. Uh, apologies for all the names I'm about to get super wrong. <laughs> it's pronounced <laughs> Ace. I, uh, well, I thought that was Axe. <laughs> Ass Freely. <laughs> Freely, yes. Okay, so we got on Saturday, uh, Eric Singer and Ace Freely, of course, Bob Kulik, uh, Michael Jammies Jackson, <laughs> uh, Brent Fitz, Todd Kearns, Bill Starkey, Lydia Chris, Carl Cochran, Robert Fleischman, and Roman Fernandez. Very cool. And that's just Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> if that ain't enough. Right. So then Sunday, you got uh, Ace again, and then both Bruce and Bob Kulik are going to be there. Uh, Anton Fig, John Regan, Todd Howarth, Mark Slaughter, Brent Fitz, Todd Kearns, and Roman Fernandez. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm sure Roman's probably going to bring along with him uh, the same information he had last year, you know, even computers where you could sit down, fill out the ballot to, um, you know, petition to get Bill LaCoin into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So if, if you guys haven't done that, please, you know, make sure you take a minute, you know, sit down at one of those computers at the thing, or even if you got to fill something out, you know, show the support, you know, let's try to make this happen. Um, definitely want to try to get Roman on the show at some point. I believe we talked to him last year at the Expo 2 and never got to follow through. Um, so we'll try to work on that and definitely some other guests. Yeah, you know, I'm definitely excited to meet Lydia Chris, mainly mainly because I just want to buy her book finally. And, uh, you know, I've always heard how great her book is and what better way than just buying it from her herself at the expo and, you know, autographed on top of that. So, and of course, Michael James Jackson, Anton Fig, I'm real excited to meet. Um, so speaking of Anton Fig, though, um, a little, little interesting piece of uh, Kiss news that popped up the other day um, on the Eddie Trunk show. Uh, he had Eddie Kramer as a guest. And according to Eddie Kramer, he says that uh, Anton Fig actually played on Rocket Ride and uh, I believe All American Man on the Alive 2, you know, extra tracks, obviously. Uh, that, was, that was his news to my ear. It kind of like after all these years like you know I, I always thought it never really sounded like peter playing but we what nobody was really sure at the same time exactly who it was so i mean it just to me that just like takes his you know being a member of the kiss family and all of his involvement that we knew from here to like here now because <laughs> yeah i mean dynasty unmasked you know that stuff that's one thing and then you know fraley's common all that other stuff and now knowing that he played on pretty much almost all the tracks, or at least two of the best ones on Alive 2 of the new stuff. I mean, that's, you know, you're, you're right in the, the heart of Kiss's popularity right there. And right. You know, he's playing on that stuff, along with Bob Kulik, not to mention, you know. That's a killer, that's a killer band right there. <laughs> you know, it would have been interesting to see if they had ended up just... You know, in an alternate dimension, they just decided right then and there to let Ace and Peter go, take the makeup off, and go with Bob Kulik and Anton Fig. That would have been an interesting time. Yes. So I'm curious now, to like, just to kind of get a, a, a double uh, confirmation from Anton himself to see what he says about that. And, uh, maybe, you know, maybe he can give us a little more light on the details of it. And maybe there were even more than just those two songs, for all we know. Right. Come to find out, he played on the first album. <laughs> no, I don't know. No, I'm, I'm sure he didn't. But one second. So, what's your take on that? Do you feel like that's a um, 
you know, it, it really did happen, or maybe Eddie's kind of remembering things wrong at this point, or... Honestly, I don't think it surprises me too much, especially knowing that they were already into using Bob on tracks, and then, of course, Bob Ezrin kind of having introduced them to the thought of, if you're not getting what you want on your song with the guy you have, find somebody else, which which isn't necessarily a thought process that I agree with from a from a producing standpoint, I guess. Right. But uh, maybe in Ace and Peter's case, it makes a little more sense in that era. But uh, but yeah, to me, it it's not really that surprising to think that if Peter wasn't up to par, or if he just didn't show up that day and they needed it done, if Anton was there, why not? Yeah, and you know, and at that time when you know drugs and alcohol were starting to affect the way they play, I mean, I could I could totally understand that. I mean, you know, I'd I'd, I'd be the same way. Right. You know, if 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 you're if you're that bad to where you're affecting your own ability to play, which in turn is going to affect the band itself and the quality of the music, then, yeah, it's like, all right, who's someone we could grab real quick and exactly. come in and do this, you know? Yeah. So so a couple uh, recent anniversaries that happened. Um, first off was, let's see, March 12th was the anniversary of the actual uh, CD VHS release of MTV Unplugged. Um, so another huge moment in the history, um, you know, I, I could still vaguely remember watching it as it happened. And, uh, you know, at the time I didn't, you know, catch on with a lot of the songs. Cause you know, at the time it was like kind of weird hearing Kiss songs played on an acoustic, you know, I felt like there was kind of something missing from the show by not being electric. But then of course, as years have gone and at this point now where we sit, I'm, you know, I love the whole thing. You know, I've, I don't know how many times I've slobbered about coming home, like how much I love that version better. Yeah. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, Ace and Peter coming back out, that was such a like jaw dropping moment. Like, Oh my God, they're actually doing it. And you know, everybody, and obviously everyone was hoping, you know, it was going to lead to something, which we all know it did. Um, but, you know, there were still, like, at the time, you know, because I was, I don't know, I'm, I was probably like 15, 14, 15 at the time that it aired. So I'm like, oh, you know, it's weird because it's not, they're not playing electric. And, oh, it's weird because they don't have the makeup and stuff on, especially Ace and Peter. <laughs> it's like, we want to see that. And, yeah. But, you know, I, I took it for what it was. I didn't, at the time, appreciate the, the music as well. Like I said, I... I do at this point. So, um, so when did you first see it? Did, were you able to watch it when it first aired or how old were you at the oh, time? Lord, no, uh, I probably would only been four or five. <laughs> okay. So yeah, uh, I'm not sure that I was anything more than subconsciously aware of the kiss music playing all the time in that moment. But, uh, I know dad had the CD of it and I don't, specifically recall listening to it until later in life, but I do have a memory of um, my Uncle Tony having a VHS copy of it, and I feel like it might have been a bootleg because it had all the outtakes and everything. Oh, yeah. It. And uh, and I remember watching it then, but by then I, I think I knew enough about Kiss that, that it didn't really bother me. You know, I knew that they were out of makeup. Actually, I was actually a bit curious to see what do Ace and Peter look like out of makeup, you know what I mean? And then I, I don't think I was as familiar with the songs then either. But, uh, yeah, I remember thinking it was a pretty good concert. And then, of course, the country version of God of Thunder, which <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. And then about... Uh... 20 takes that it took for Domino <laughs> to get it right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. But absolutely excellent. Excellent. The, the way the songs translated into acoustic was great. And then I know they talk about this every time too, but the way Bruce was able to do some of those solos still on an acoustic. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like, uh, what was it? Um, like the rock bottom like doing the solo from out bottom on there and uh um what was what was the other one uh 
world without heroes and yeah um i still love you you know doing a lot of that stuff on acoustic is you know i'm not a guitar player but i understand how difficult that stuff is to translate it to an acoustic so <laughs> um what was uh so yeah there is there is that version that floats around out there in the bootleg circuit where it is the entire uncut i don't, no idea where that came from but it's a yeah. great it's a great watch if any if anyone hasn't seen it, it's definitely longer uh you know don't expect it to be all you know perfect like the version you saw on tv and everything and you know that there's definitely a lot of uh false starts and you know mess ups and you know multiple takes in certain songs and then like the goof off stuff like we mentioned and uh it's definitely worth watching but you know, once I got the uh, official home video release, um, I that was the first thing I saw after the actual airing. I didn't see this bootleg version until much, much longer down the road. But, um, you know, I remember they added that little documentary piece at the beginning, which I thought was really cool because you got to see, you know, rehearsal footage and, you know, some of the, like, what what appeared to be, you know, the first time that, you know, Ace walked in that they seen each other in however long and, um, <laughs> and, uh, one thing that always stuck out that Paul talks about in that little documentary and it, it still sticks with me to this day is he always says that, you know, if you can train, like I'm paraphrasing, but if you could translate a song to acoustic, that's a good song. If you try to play it on acoustic and it sounds like shit or you can't work it out, then it's probably not a good song. And that, that always, you know, stuck with me there. And, you know, it's true. Like, all that Kiss music translated perfect. I They they could do another two episodes probably with more Kiss songs, you know, that, that, yeah. that they could have added. So, you know, it was endless. I don't know why, but I always... I, it... The way Gene greets them sticks with me. I, I can always <laughs> picture that. Hi, Pete. And, <laughs> you <know? laughs> yep. And you know, a lot, a lot. There were some of those like moments where it was like, you know, when they would, when they did songs like "World Without Heroes." It, that was probably the first time they ever performed that song. Um, you know, "See You Tonight." I mean, never had heard that song played live in any, you know, form before that. Right. Uh, so we were getting that type of thing, like, oh my God, songs they had never played live before, let alone, um, you know, with the original four or with all six guys, you know, on stage at the same time too, with hearing all these different versions of things. And, you know, the acoustic version of Beth is still one of my favorites. Yep. Um, <laughs> definitely better than the, uh, the Dynasty Tour version of Beth. <laughs> That's on the Largo cassette. <laughs> yeah, That's actually how I play it when we do it. Yeah. It's based on the acoustic version from MTV Unplugged. Yeah. Um, well, probably just about everyone that watches this doesn't know. But yeah, we when we perform Beth, we now do it where Luke plays it on guitar. And it, in our opinion, it uh, sounds better that way. Um hit the notes a little better and uh just overall you know so we, we we were using the original you know instrumental track like kiss uses or used to use so wow we're at uh 20 22 years now that that was released <laughs> that's ridiculous i know it, it still boggles my mind like to think like the reunion stuff and even Psycho Circus now is 20 years old. Yeah. It's like, to me, that's just impossible. Like, because I, I remember in the 90s, you know, around that time that that stuff was happening, thinking back, like, okay, all that, the prime stuff in the 70s was 20 years ago at that time. And it, yeah. And to me, it always felt like, oh, you know, that I, I just wonder what that would have been like, you know, 20 years ago and blah, blah. And here we are now, things are 20 and 30 years old, and I still remember them like yesterday, so it's like, oh my god, like, it just, it blows my mind, you know? Yeah. And then, like, I remember even in the 80s when I was a little kid, and I would think the same thing about the Beatles, like, oh, that was only 20 years ago, got it. 
you know how how different and long ago that would have been and <laughs> but it, it, yeah i just can't wrap my head around it it's you know psycho circus is you know 20 years old this year and the reunion is you know over over 20 years old now and yeah <laughs> nuts. absolutely nuts it really is and it's literally a whole new lifetime like a lot of these younger fans may they may not have even discovered psycho circus yet they may only know sonic boom monster or just started with monster you know all kinds of different you know they may not have even heard psycho circus or unplugged or know that much of the history yet right and to me it's just it's just so hard to think that <laughs> yeah to think in the world that there's a kiss fan out there that doesn't know uh it doesn't know the song goose i mean that's mind-boggling enough but to think yeah there's people out there that have never heard stuff from revenge or or psycho circus that to them that's not not even something that enters their thoughts when it comes to kiss is such a strange thought yeah it's crazy man <laughs> so uh so something else uh that had a recent anniversary which is also now approaching 20 years itself again crazy which was the start of the farewell tour uh happened in 2000 it's god almost 20 years for that now jesus mm. a farewell tour like go figure 20 years later wow we're still speculating on whether they're going to call it quits soon. <laughs> and like, you know, watching the whole thing on VH1 where they did that interview, I mean, I swear it wasn't, it felt like yesterday. Like, I watch that now and I feel like it's still new. Yeah. And it's just so crazy to think 20 years already, just about. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. um, so the farewell tour definitely had a lot of uh, special meaning for both Luke and I. Uh, I know Luke that was your first kiss show you attended so yeah uh, kind of take us back through that again mm. yeah that uh, that was definitely an interesting time I would have been either eight or nine I don't remember the exact date that it was uh, and I only got to go because uh, my dad ended up getting three tickets for him and two of his students and then for some reason at the last minute one of his students couldn't go so I got to go instead, so thank God for that, because uh, now I can say, even though I don't have a whole lot of specific memories of it, that I, I saw the original four guys. Um, I remember it being very loud. I remember really needing to pee, and there was too long of a line, and people were peeing on the gate outside the restroom, <laughs> which to my eight-year-old self, I was like, gross, <laughs> what are people doing? Uh and then uh, I think the this is this is kind of stupid. I'm pretty sure I told this story on the the first episode where Paulie and I were on here. But my one really specific memory of of that performance is that Dad bought the tour book, and in that book is the that one promotional shot I think from the Destroyer era where Peter has the bandage wrapped around his head and it's kind of bloody. And I remember him passing that picture in that tour book, and I asked him, "Hey, what's wrong with Peter's head?" And just without even hesitating, Dad was like, oh, Gene bit him. <laughs> and, the, yeah, and, the, and the dude next to us on the other side thought that must have been the most hilarious thing he'd ever heard ever. That's such a great answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he bit him. <laughs> and then just without, Peter's just, face on that picture, too. Like, <laughs> he looks all depressed. And <laughs> yeah. Oh, Gene bit me. <laughs> yeah, every time. He gets me when I'm not looking. <laughs> so do you recall any you know particular moments that stuck out to you during that show whether it was like a certain song performance or you know some sort of rap stage rap or anything or yeah i think the only thing that really that i can recall specifically is uh ace's solo i remember him letting go of the guitar and it just stayed there you know, which, of course, again, to my eight-year-old self was like, how did he do that? <laughs> Holy crap, he just let go of the guitar and it just sat there. Which I think, too, uh, I feel like Ted Nugent did that trick also because he opened, only he shot his guitar with a bow. <laughs> that Yeah, that is true. Um, 
we can definitely get into that too because yeah for i almost forgot you know nugent open skid row open yeah. uh, the not sebastian box skid row he was already gone at that point um so that was an interesting thing too so I, I just i just barely recall him like coming out on like a white buffalo or either he came out on it or had one come out on stage at one point during one of the songs and you know it was crazy but <laughs> nuts and I, you know, I enjoyed Nugent, you know, but I didn't know as much of his catalog now as I did then. And, um, you know, it was starting to get to the point where I was kind of getting a little bored and antsy because I'm like, okay, I feel like he's played enough. Like, let's get to Kiss. And <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> but um, I do remember enjoying it. Skid Row, I don't remember anything. I think I just kind of sat down for their whole set and, um you know, because again, it was like, ah, Sebastian Bach ain't with him. I don't really care. And <laughs> yeah. Um, it was definitely a special show for me, too. Um, uh, that was the only time that I ever got to see Kiss with my dad. And, um, you know, he's the one that introduced me to Kiss also back when I was little and everything. And um, it just so happened that when I heard that tour was coming back, I asked my dad if he wanted to go for once because I had never been to a concert with him, period. And uh, my first Kiss concert was the Psycho Circus Tour. My mom took me to that, so I, I, I guess at the time I was thinking, well, it's only fitting. I've seen him with my mom. Now I need to see him with my dad. You know, he did introduce me to him. Yeah. And so, yeah, I remember very well, you know, both of us were just so into it, had a great time. Um you know, he, he probably enjoyed Nugent a little better than I did at the time, but <laughs> um, as far as the Kiss show itself, yeah, I mean, I, I do remember the Ace solo, uh, him doing the, uh, what was it, the 2001 uh, Space Odyssey theme, I think yep. it was. Yeah. And um, and then for whatever reason, when Gene was, did, did his uh, blood thing, and then when, mm -hmm. he, when he does the, oh yeah, in the mic, I recall him... Like, he did a couple of the oh yeahs, and then all of a sudden he was just like, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> and that was when that was like the big, you know, the big catchphrase at the time everybody was doing it. And I had never heard him do that in concert before, so when I heard him do that, I was like, oh my God, like, you know, just that little thing. I'm thinking, oh my God, that was something special that he did here that, you know, nobody else probably ever heard. And I'm not sure if he has done it in other shows or not. I, he probably has. But, um... As far as I recall, I don't think I've seen him do it in any, like, shows that I've seen, you know, like on YouTube or whatever from that period. But So I don't know. i probably wrong. But some reason that always sticks out with me is him doing that during his little solo area. <laughs> that is pretty cool. Um, you know, and I know a lot of people talk about how bad the band was playing at the time. But, you know, personally, I don't remember that. I, I mean, for one, I didn't realize that there was a lot of tension going on at that time. And, um, you know, I, I assume they were still getting along pretty well and this happened to be the farewell tour. And, you know, it was like a sad feeling more than anything. Like, as far as I remember, they sounded good. I mean, I mean, yeah, I've heard shows since, you know, that do sound kind of bad, but, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if it was just being there or what, but I, I don't recall ever saying a word about them sounding bad. My dad, I don't recall him saying anything about that. So I don't know. Yeah. And I do remember after the show, there were, you know, cause you always got people outside trying to sell bootleg shirts afterwards. And, um, there was a guy like all the way up the road, like on the exit ramp to go back on 675. He was like all the way up there on that exit ramp, standing there trying to sell shirts to people, kiss shirts. Jesus. And I just remember like how huge the whole atmosphere felt, you know, like Kiss is in town, you know, you got these guys all the way up here trying to sell their shirts and stuff. It's the only time I've seen that happen. I mean, you know, when they played, you know, a year or two ago here, that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. I don't recall anything like that. I saw them at Riverbend. And also the Indiana State Fair. I think that was in 2011. That would have been, yeah, the Sonic Boom Tour, I know. It might have yeah. been 2010, actually. Yeah, now, probably. 
and it was a week apart. But yeah, I mean, now given both of those things were kind of festivals already, so it would have been kind of hard for that sort of thing to happen. But yeah, I don't remember there being, you know, a lot of people around doing stuff they weren't supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, eight, 18 years now at this point, farewell tour. Um, so while we're, while we're thinking of it still, um, go on the comments or even on our Facebook page. We want to hear your stories. Uh, you know, did you attend any farewell uh, tour dates? What do you remember from that? Um, did you watch Unplugged as it happened, and or you know buying the CD VHS? You know, was that the first time you heard it? And what was what was your first thoughts? And yeah, you know, we want to hear your stories about it. So you know, definitely uh, chime in, and uh, you know, maybe we'll uh, read a few of the comments here on the show next week. That reminds me, too, when we were at that show Saturday, uh, the poor owner, for some reason, let Gino get a hold of the uh, jukebox prior to us playing. So for, I don't know, what, probably the first three or four hours that we were at the venue, it was nothing but Kiss songs playing over their speakers. <laughs> and, uh, and one of the songs that played was the, uh, the Destroyer Resurrected remaster of Sweet Pain with the Ace Freely solo. And I honestly, I kind of forgot how good that sounded. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I still personally think we should do that song as our namesake. Um, and then, yeah, we were all enjoying it. We are all sitting outside. They had a little patio spot outside just, you know, chatting, you know, killing time. And, you know, the speaker was out there listening to Kiss music. And then yeah. I got I, then I got a thing. I was like, why, why, why couldn't we have just played a bunch of songs that we weren't going to play that night <laughs> over the jukebox. There's plenty of Kiss music. That's true. <laughs> On the plus side, I did get to correct a couple of things. Uh, I realized uh, when the Alive 3 version of Domino was playing that I always mess up some of the little things that Bruce plays at the end during those last couple of choruses. So I was like, ooh, here's my chance. I can fix this before we play. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Gene always... Uh, has trouble with Domino, even whether it was unplugged or uh, just shows in general, man. Yeah. And because some reason I never really caught it until we were out there that day. Like I heard the lyric pop. I don't like that's wrong. Like that's not what the lyric's supposed to be at that point. That lover, mm -hmm. I confess. Like he he goes to that lyric so much. <laughs> I was watching that. Um, I believe it was the Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo show from like 94 which i think is actually it's I, I, is it the bonus disc on one of the kissologies i believe like it's one of the bonus discs you can get might be yeah i want to say and man when they got to domino on that show it was a train wreck i mean gene <laughs> gene had every lyric wrong pretty much uh you could see paul over there kind of looking at him like what the hell are you doing and and there's a moment where you see him kind of go up to Bruce and, you know, I think he's got his back turned and he goes up to Bruce and you could see he's like kind of saying something to him, but I would have loved to know what he said there. And cause then he just, it was real quick and back to playing. <laughs> After this tour, we're going to fire this loser. <laughs> <laughs> he loves that lover, lover. I confess lyric. That's, that's what he kept going to for everything. <laughs> <laughs> all right so another uh recent little interesting kind of tidbit popped up recently um there was some photos of a uh, ace in the studio with eric singer and a couple other people so apparently eric uh you know laid down some tracks for ace's new album um assuming you know he's just gonna guest appear on a few tracks not play on the whole album um, as far as we know, you know, Gene's going to be on it as well. Um, and if they are still pushing for this, uh, what do you say, end of April release? Yeah. I feel like they're going to kind of need to really start pushing because I don't, I, I mean, we have no idea, you know, how far the process is, you know, but if Eric's just now doing some drum tracks, I would think that they would still have to put everything else over top of that if that's oh, right. <laughs> a little late to still be adding stuff if it's going to be done in april right so either either they're working day and night or you know 24 7 something yeah <laughs> yeah 
but yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited to hear that. I'm, I know Eric uh, appeared on Bruce's album, but it was just one song, and um, you know, I'm really curious to hear what he's going to do on Ace's new album, especially you know that's as I've said before, like one of my favorite. Uh, lineups was when Eric and Ace played together. I thought they meshed really well. So I'm definitely curious to hear what this is going to sound like. Uh, let alone if it happens to be one of the tracks that Gene's on, too. I mean, it's practically my favorite lineup playing together again, except for Paul, you know? Right. <laughs> so, pretty excited about that. You know, Ace's album, uh, as far as we know, coming out in April, and then uh, plenty of time, you know, to have it before the expo hits. And, uh, yeah, maybe maybe he'll even perform some of those tracks at the expo. Uh, we do know he is going to perform, so that's definitely a possibility. Yeah. And, and with Eric being there on Saturday, I'm, I'm sure they'll probably do the songs that Eric played on. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I'm curious, too, because the, they had mentioned that Ace might get up on stage with Bruce and Bob. And I'm kind of curious what they'll do with that, too. Oh, my God, that'll be insane <laughs> I don't think I'm, I'm I might be wrong but I as far as I know I haven't seen Bruce and Ace on the stage together since unplugged right as far as I know Wow <laughs> and I hope it is something different than rock and roll all night or you know something like I want to hear them do yes. you know just do like a jam you know and or you know something or do do a song from the, you know, a deeper cut from the era, not, you know, something like Rock and Roll All Night, you know. Right. Which I think, I mean, that is kind of the point of Bruce and Bob's band, you know, is for the sake of the deeper cuts, or at least deeper than than 70s popular Kiss, I guess. True, yeah. Because so, they, yeah. they definitely do that and a lot of the 80s stuff, you know, they dive right, right in. Yeah, I'm, I cannot wait, man. <laughs> Definitely. You, I, I just, I, I can't imagine where does somebody get the gall to tell Kiss of all bands, hey, don't use your pyrotechnics. Right. I mean, are you gonna, I don't know, tell a football team to not bring your equipment and you know don't wear pads and don't bring a football? <laughs> right. That's so like, that's got to be part of the contract for Kiss coming to play. It's like, if we can't do a certain amount of what we're known for, we're not coming. Yeah, it's like, why would you even book them in the first place if you know that the pyrotechnics would be an issue? Right. When it's a band like Kiss. <laughs> Doesn't make a bit of sense. So what we're referring to... Um, another recent anniversary hit that Paul shared on his Twitter. Uh, it was back in 99. Um, particular show they played, they uh, told them they weren't allowed to use pyrotechnics. Well, of course, they, uh, you know, they followed the rules, but at the very end, on the very last song, they set every little bit of pyrotechnics that they had off for that song. <laughs> And like Paul said on the on the tweet, nobody can stop us. Yeah. And it's like, what were they going to do? Like, oh, show's over. It's like, yeah, it's already over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that just uh, doesn't make any sense at all. No, it doesn't. I mean, it's, it's so asinine. It's like, you know, booking Alice Cooper. You, you can't do your decapitation on stage. You can't, you know, do all this. All the theatrical stuff that is Alice Cooper, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Although I have to admit, it probably would have been pretty cool to see every bit of it go off at once. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> Looks like there's actual video of that. <laughs> or even the pyro guy himself is like, sure, I'm not wasting this pyro. Yeah. 
That kind of reminds me, speaking of the pyro, I was watching, I picked up a DVD of, um, it was a show they were playing over in Japan, I believe it was on the Rock the Nation tour. Um, hadn't seen it before, it's a good show by the way, was, obviously the set list for that tour was awesome too. But, oh yeah. Um, it's, it's, it, I want to say it's at the end, because, um, yeah it is, because it's when the confetti cannons are going off, rock and roll all night. Well, it gets to that point where, uh, you know, Paul's doing the, the false, you know, smashing the guitar, and then when he stops and you know kind of holds it up and, you know, waits, you know, some crowd. Well, the the confetti thing just kept going and going, and he's just standing there the whole time, like waiting, and it's just like going and going, and then finally he walks over to the mic, and he says it quietly, but you hear him, and he just goes right to the mic. He's like, "Turn the fucking thing off." <laughs> and then he goes right back to the back to it and they immediately turned him off and then does the real break and all that stuff i thought that was really cool that's i've never seen that happen before either <laughs> yeah it's gotta be crazy it's like how much freaking confetti is in there <laughs> yeah, i mean that's just you know that just shows right there paul man he as soon as they, as soon as he said that, they immediately shut that thing off, and he, they probably still got yelled at afterwards too. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know, I've heard I've heard Gene kind of, you know, cuss out and say things to the light guys and you know things like that, but I've never really heard Paul do that to any of those guys. You know, especially the pyro guys. <laughs> really cool show. Really, really good set list. Um, yeah, and the Alive Forever book it, that gives a little lot in the note. Uh, the fire marshal prohibited use of all pyro effects. Kiss obliged his wishes until Black Diamond, when they unloaded the entire show's complement of pyrotechnics, creating one of the most impressive displays of fire and sound seen at any Kiss concert. <laughs> <laughs> On March 11th in Germany, it says... While kidding around on stage, Paul asked Ace if he spoke German. Ace then replied, Ja, ja, Deutschland, Deutschland. Uber, <laughs> Uber allies. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Thus committing the exact same mistake that Paul had committed at the Berlin show. <laughs> oh. Which, I guess, uh, prior to Rock and Roll All Night, Paul sang Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber allies. Which, due to its affiliation with Adolf Hitler, is a forbidden part of the German national anthem. Oh, no! <laughs> Realizing Paul's error, Gene quickly interrupted Paul, but a chorus of boost st <laughs> still issued from the crowd. <laughs> oh my god, I wonder if there's video of that. Yeah. Holy cow. <laughs> I would have felt like asking Ace something like that would have been just asking for it anyway. Oh, yeah, you're, you're asking for the powder keg there. Yeah. Oh, my God. That is something I would love to see on video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right, so unless I'm forgetting anything, I think that's going to do it for this week. Anything else you want to close up with? Not that I can think of. All right. Again, get your expo tickets. Get your hotel room. We want to see you all there. Uh, get on in the comments. Again, share us your memories of Unplugged and the Farewell Tour. Um, good or bad. So. All righty. Um, again, thanks for watching. Subscribe. Like the page. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>